The first point of comparison is appearance. Mario, the red plumber, man of lead, certainly looks a lot like Stalin, with his short stature, his mustache, and his big nose. Later on, we will learn that he is Italian, but that's after the initial vision had been watered down and commercialized. It is games first made in these earliest stages that their psychological representation is most apparent. Mario, the working man, in the image of Joseph Stalin, collects coins. When he has enough coins, he gets an extra life. This is evidence that Mario doesn't so much resemble a single man, but is symbolic of the worker's struggle against Bowser, who clearly represents monarchy autocrat and autocratic privilege of the capitalists. When he has 100 coins, the working man can afford to have a child, or perhaps save someone's life who would have starved, adding an extra man to the revolutionary struggle against Bowser and his minions. And when another person joins the struggle at that time, Mario becomes larger immediately, <clears throat> or gains an extra man for later, depending on the color of the mushroom. Throughout the game, defenders of monarchists and capitalists are depicted as fungus, as hideous turtles, and many other shelled creatures impervious to logic and the good news of the workers' revolution. In fact, when you try to give them logic, what do they do? They turtle up. They go inside their, their shells and they... Well, I think that's pretty obvious. You have Lakitu up in his ivory tower, well, up in the clouds, throwing down such students who, while perhaps left-wing, are a far cry from the communists and serve to cripple the Mario-led revolution, as all half-measures do. The Hammer Brothers, with their military helmets and their use of hammers, a symbol often used in fascist flags and imagery, are the shock troops of this capitalist oppression. Odd that hammers would be the choice of throwing implement until you look at it as a reference to fascist movements. It could represent the hammer from the hammer and sickle, but everything else suggests that hammers here are fascist hammers, going with the general picture being painted here. <clears throat> There is an air of elitism in all of this, much like the communists of old tended to have, in that they portray the good guys, the people on Mario's side, as being half fungus. Not total fungus, like the Bowser supporting Goombas, Goombas, but still half fungus. They're nice people, but they're depicted somewhat incompetent. The mushrooms making Mario larger, or giving him an extra life, is symbolic of the Russian everyman, depicted as a fungus, to a degree, uh, joining his cause. If Mario is battling monarchy, though, well then why then does he support Princess Peach? This seems very odd, to battle one monarchy just to impose another, but I don't think of it like this. When, in any Mario game, have you ever heard of the Toads, right, who represent the Russian working class, paying taxes to Princess Peach? Never. You never hear of anything like that. In this sense, I don't see Princess Peach as representing an actual regime, or an actual monarchy, but as being symbolic of Mother Russia. And so Mario, as metaphor for the workers' revolutionary struggle, must battle the monarchist and fascist hordes in order to liberate Mother Russia, who is trapped by them. In the end of the levels, he takes down the uh, SS skull flag on his way to completely saving Mother Russia. The Fire Flower is an interesting power-up. It is the only way to kill the Spinies. The Spinies, of course, are, you know, college radicals. Hence their red color and their, and their spiky hair. They're dropped out of the uh, pie-in-the-sky world by the Lakitu, the professor, academic kind of person. You can see his uh, rounded eyes that, that look like glasses. They're dropped down from, from the college world into reality. Okay? And this is commentary about how these fools end up doing, unwittingly, doing the bidding of the uh, fascist, capitalist, monarchist types. The only way to beat these people is with the fire of capitalism. That is, to get them into a real job, at which point they become politically moderate and thus neutralized, represented by them falling off the screen. Bowser breathes fire out of his mouth, and so does Mario. Oh, didn't really think of that. Did... But Mario hides this, right? I always thought it was a bit odd that Mario put his hand way up to cover his mouth when he threw the fireball. 
well, this seems odd, but it makes sense when you recognize that Mario is actually spitting fire as well, just as Bowser is, fit, is spitting the fire of capitalism. Mario hides this, which is why every time he spits fire, he hides his mouth. So, this also explains why in Super Mario World, later down the line, enemies turn into coins when you hit them with a fireball. This is commentary, support for the labor theory of values, talking about how fierce capitalism turns labor, uh, turns the labor of living beings into money. No, not, not, not their labor, uh, but their very being, with Mario collecting the surplus value. And if he gets enough, he can earn an extra life. When you sell, be, because a common point among anarchists and communists is that you are not selling your labor, you are selling yourself. And so when Mario hits you with the fire of capitalism, you are not, it is not your labor that is turned into a coin, it is you that is turned into a coin. And that Mario has to do this, despite being the revolutionary vanguard, is a somber recognition that sometimes you must break with your principles from time to time if you want the larger revolutionary revolution to ultimately succeed. As interesting as that is, that's merely the backdrop for my analysis of Mario 2. Originally, this video was only going to be about Mario 2, but I decided to give a little bit of backstory regarding Mario 1 before getting into the main event. Super Mario 2, Mario Madness, as released in the United States. Originally, this was going to be Mario 2 in Japan. However, Nintendo of Japan decided to release a different version of Super Mario 2 that resembled, that more resembled the original game, um, which in the U.S. became known as The Lost Levels. The game that was going to be Super Mario 2 in Japan had the sprites changed a bit and was renamed Doki Doki Panic and was based off of some show in Japan. Meanwhile, Nintendo of America decided to take Doki Doki Panic, change the graphics... Uh, Oh, excuse me. Meanwhile, Nintendo of America decided to take Doki Doki Panic, change the graphics back to Mario graphics, and then release it in the U.S. and call it Mario 2, Mario Madness. This was before the internet, so very few people knew about this. So from here on in, I'll just refer to what is called Mario 2 in the U.S. as Mario Madness. Mario Madness was released in October of 1988. So the Soviet Union was in bad shape at this time. It would begin to disintegrate in less than a year. It is hard to pinpoint where exactly this game is modeled off of. Egypt, Persia, the Mideast, India, Central Asia. It's an area called Subcon, but all I can say is that it has a rather Asiatic feel. Mario 1 was simply laying out the basic idea of class struggle, which is reflected in the graphics. The graphics are very rigid, orderly, piece by piece, and this, I believe, is either a conscious or subconscious aesthetic reflection of the underlying lesson, which is of a rigid dialectical materialism and a scientistic labor theory of value. Mario Madness, on the other hand, was about cultural Marxism and the expansion of communism into the Orient. During World War I, Marxists across Europe predicted that the working class would not rally around the flag, but would rally around the class and rise up together against national identity and bourgeois institutions such as the church, property, and autocratic states, overthrow them and usher in a dictatorship of the proletariat, and then begin their evolution to stateless communism. When this did not happen, several Marxists decided to set up the Frankfurt School. The purpose of the Frankfurt School was to deconstruct national identity, religious identity, and racial identity, these things being considered to be false consciousness that stood in the way of the true class consciousness. In the Soviet Union, the Frankfurt, stool, uh, the Frankfurt School didn't gain much ground, however. Um, but toward the end, I believe the creators of Mario Madness were aware that communism's future lie in the Orient. The story of the game is that Mario... <clears throat> who we have already established is the representative for the workers' revolution, had a dream that he, Luigi, Princess Peach, and Toad find a stairway that Mario saw in his dream and open the door to enter Subcon. Now, this is a reference to the Freudian idea of a collective subconscious that the Frankfurt School referred to. And so this game is actually painting the dreams and aspirations of the collective subconscious of the Asiatic world outside of uh, European Russia and the Eastern Bloc. 
Wart, of course, represents foreign imperialists. Not Bowser, he's, he's another form of Bowser, but he's a Bowser from somewhere else. Bowser, of course, is those forces in uh, Russia and the Eastern Bloc and, 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 the, and the Warsaw Pact countries. Wart, on the other hand, represents pr probably the United States and Britain and, and, and the Anglosphere. Uh, interventions in the Orient. And in this dream, the workers' revolution throws out the foreign imperialists and their puppet dictators, and all is made good in subcon, at which point Mario wakes up. <clears throat> and as we know, he woke up to the reality of the Soviet Union collapsing. The enemies are all symbolic of the problems faced in spreading communism around the world. First is Tweeter. Tweeter, of course, has a mask similar to those used during the Great Bubonic Plague. The mask was supposedly used to trick demons into thinking that the wearer wasn't a human in hopes that they would pass up uh, that person for someone else, that they wouldn't get the bubonic plague, that the that whatever forces were was infecting people would pass them up thinking that they were not human. Right? And this is obviously quite silly, quite superstitious. And Twitter represents this religious thinking as the opiate of the masses used by autocrats like Wart to maintain their power. Related is Baba who is a living bomb. He is representative of suicide bombers motivated by religion. Sniffit wears a gas mask, similar to those worn by soldiers during the Great War, World War I. Thus, uh, he thus represents old-fashioned nationalism that led to the horrors of World War I. In the manual, it says of Sniffit, quote, he wears a mask and spits the bullets of evil dreams from his mouth. Evil dreams? Like, the false consciousness of national identity? Is that what you're trying to say, Nintendo? I think so. Birdo is very interesting. Birdo represents a corruption of cultural Marxism. The manual says of Birdo, quote, He thinks he is a girl, and he spits eggs from his mouth. Birdo represents the radical feminism and gender minority movements that grew out of cultural Marxism. The problem is that all of these various social justice movements, despite uh, tracing their origins back to the Frankfurt School and cultural Marxism, have nothing to do with advancing the workers' revolution. The workers' revolution is about breaking down the barriers to class identity. LGBTQ issues are not relevant to that. In fact, they impair cultural Marxism by turning the left into a freak show. How prescient that even in 1988, Nintendo was aware of the growing problem of the second wave cultural Marxists, symbolized by the gender-bending Birdo, who throws away his reproductive potential. Right? Instead of having kids, he chooses to be a freak show and spit his eggs out of his mouth, right? which is symbolic of him throwing away his, his reproduction, having nothing to do with advancing the workers' revolution, in fact, positive, being a positive harm to it. Mauser is another enemy of the revolution from the left, kind of like Birdo. The description of Mauser says as much. It says, quote, It is a bomber of bad dreams that destroys good dreams. It is proud, and it doesn't believe that it is just a mouse. Hmm. Much like the anarchists don't believe that they are just a sideline, permafringe movement. This bomb-throwing anarchist also has shades because he thinks he's so cool. He's so radical. Keep his mind that his bombs kill capitalist fascistic monarchists as well, as you could see in some of his levels, and communists alike. His immature, narcissistic anti-authoritarianism is another enemy from within the left that keeps Wart in power. Next, look at Triclide. The color scheme here is very important. In Mario Advance, there um, and All Stars, they changed the palette of Triclide to, to green and, and yellow, I think. But as usual, it is the original game, it is the early games that give us clues into what the creators were trying to say. In the original game, the color palette is red, white, and black. Red, white, and black. So what, you may be asking? Well, in addition to this, Triclide has three heads and a tail. That's four appendages branching off from a center. Triclide is a living swastika. What's more, the manual states, quote, He was once an outsider. But now, he is one of Wart's helpers, since he impressed Wart with his cunning brain and his offensive capabilities, which are three times normal strength. Huh. Well, that, that's an odd choice of words. Offensive 
capabilities. Nowhere else do we see reference to offensive capabilities in general in this manual. Offensive capabilities sounds like a military operation, like a lightning war of several rapid strikes. And of course, they were, uh, the Western Allies were once at war with Nazi Germany. And so, if that is what Triclide is to represent, well, of course, he was in the past at odds with Wart. But now, according to the communists, the, the fascists and the capitalists are, are one and the same, right? which is kind of some implicit uh, communist propaganda. Now, another enemy is Panzer. Now, and this is funny. Panzer has the same name as Panzer, like the German tank, and like Triclide, fires fireballs. But then again, some later Birdos also fire fireballs. So Triclide fires out the same things that the enemy named Panzer fires out. Right? This is more evidence of what Triclide is to represent. Then there are the depictions of blacks in the games. Now this is better seen in Doki Doki Panic, since in Japan you don't have the same kind of hang-ups about race as you do in the United States. So we'll look at the, at the Japanese version for this. At the end of every stage, in Doki Doki Panic, you enter uh, into the mouth of what is clearly a, an African person, a person of African ancestry. So clearly, in this instance, the Africans are allies of the communists, and they are more likely to imbibe communist ideology, the communist ideology of Mario, or whoever the workers' struggle uh, hero is, after this African has just seen the workers' hero defeat the LG, L, L, uh, LBGTQ person, right? The Tumblr feminist, the anti-fat shamer, the trans right person, whatever t social justice thing Birdo is, right? And so after f defeating the Frico leftist, symbolized by Birdo, only then is the African willing to imbibe communism. Right, and this is commentary on the uh, uh, on how Africans aren't socially conservative, right? And this is seen in polling data and election results in the United States, and that, and for example, Africans voting against gay marriage and and being in generally socially conservative and having some of the most negative views towards homosexuality, as also seen in in the uh, in the legal norms in sub-Saharan African countries. Also, the black face that imbibes you after beating Birdo will eventually turn on you at one point. There is a black face at the end who helps you throughout many levels, but at the very end, turns on you. Right? All this is saying is how the support of blacks in the communist revolution cannot be taken for granted. Right? It, they're not faithful colored companions. They are, they are real people with real motives and real issues, and, and you have to uh, not take their their support for granted. Now, given that Mario represents the collective will of the working class, and Subcon is Mario's subconscious, obviously it represents the subconscious of the working class. Uh, in this you have many political tropes. But you also have Shy Guy, who is just apathetically anti-communist, and is the faceless dream person, right? People in their, in their dreams, they don't have uh, faces. Now, in dreams, the mind has an especially difficult time creating faces, even recreating faces that you've already seen. And so what you have is a flat, non-face, uh, which is what you see in, in most people. And I, I believe the, the kind of faceless nature of Shy Guy also represents the sort of uh, anonymous uh, everyman who goes along basically supporting the status quo, not being particularly active, but being by their, merely by their apathy, being an impediment to Mario. Ninji is the formless black dream monster, right? And so, and so what we're seeing with Shy Guy and, and, and you know, the faceless man as a dream trope, and Ninji, the, the formless monster, as a dream trope. Remember, this is a dream. This is the collective subconscious. So you're going to get a lot of political themes, as described throughout this video, but you're also going to see some basic normal you know, dream tropes that everyone has in dreams. You know, one thing would be falling. Right, or being able to fly, right? You see all these other sorts of dream tropes that don't have any political significance. So, so you get both the collective subconscious, but also the more individual dream tropes. Porcupo is just Nintendo making fun of Sonic. See, oh wait a minute, Sonic didn't exist until 1991. Porcupo was also seen on the Super Mario Brothers Super Super Show episode entitled "On Her Majesty's Sewer Service." Now, this show aired in 1989, just two years before Sega created Sonic the Hedgehog. I can't really think of anything regarding Porcupo. It's just a porcupine enemy that's seen in many games uh, before and since. 
I think they wanted a spiny in this game, but they didn't want to use spiny. They wanted something novel, so they just made a porcupine enemy. So, and that's it. I hope I've given you something to think about in this video. Um, don't take this too seriously. Also, uh, Luigi is Lennon. Good job! Away to go! Ha <laughs> ha!